Speaking of uh, Daylaw and someone that might have a little bit of experience with Daylaw, let's bring in the man himself, Nate Doss, joining Tour Life for the first time. How's it going, man? Thanks for coming on here tonight. We appreciate it. Hey, it's going real good, man. And uh, appreciate you guys. Good to be here. Yeah, when we when I found out that you were planning on coming back to play on tour, and it was funny too because me and Yuli <laughs> – an episode or two before that we're saying like, we would love to see some of these players come back and play. And so the fact that a couple of weeks ago, we could get news that you're coming back. I'm like, Yuli, you have to try to get him on the podcast. You have. So we do appreciate, I know you're a very busy guy with all the stuff that you're doing out there. So we do appreciate you taking the time. I know a lot of our viewers and listeners, listeners are very excited to have you on here as well. Man, no worries. And uh, yeah, Yuli hit me up and uh, it's one of those things, man. I'm kind of not on social media all that often, so I don't really know there's even a conversation about this stuff happening. But uh, you know what? It's it's cool. It's cool to be back and uh, good to be chatting with you guys. Yeah, so, I mean, we, so go wait, ahead, one, one thing we were just you have a lot of experience with the president's cup. We just built like a little fantasy team to go over there. You've played on that team a, a bunch. Um, do you think that it's time for the president's cup team to be its own thing? 12 guys, six women, its own like tournament. Is it, is it there yet? Or are we still like a couple years behind? You know, uh, that's a great question. I mean, I definitely think it could be there. I mean, you, you say 12 men, six women. I think we certainly have the depth on the, the FPO side now to have more women. And, and I think that's the big thing. We for sure have the depth on the men's side for 12. You know, I would really think though, as the European side, I'm not sure they'd want it to be that deep. No disrespect to anybody, but that, that's a lot of players to try to field um, on, on that side of things. But I do think that it could be a little bit longer. I think it could be more than just attached to the European Open, right. I think there would be, yeah. I think a lot of people would want to see that maybe a two day event where, you know, day one is, you know, some kind of doubles or, you know, a team event. And then, you know, Sunday or whatever day two would just be all the, the singles play. I think that would be really cool. And I definitely think the fans out there would want to see it. Oh, and here, I mean, like, I don't know how much golf you like or watch or consume, but Ryder Cup's one of my favorite weeks out of uh, every two years. I Everything goes by the wayside. I'm watching that. I'm stuck to the TV. And I, because of that, I, I have to think that it would be that electric for, for disc golf as well. But anyways, Brody was getting to, to uh, uh, ask some questions, but the, I, feel, yeah. I felt like since you had been involved in the team for so long that you would have good input on that bad boy. Yeah, I think, I think honestly, disc golf pro tour just – nuke the all-star event just literally drop a nuke on it let's get rid of it <laughs> let's put the resources into this president's cup and let's put the resources into a manufacturer cup that's what the people want to see they don't want to wow. see this all-star event where people are putting from 20 feet on one knee <laughs> no one wants to see that anymore give them the manufacturer's cup give them the all uh, the president's cup and uh i think everyone will be happy so all right First question I've got for you it has to be on the top of a lot of people's minds. Why? <laughs> Why now? Why this event? What What is the reasoning to saying, you know what? I haven't played in some time. Now I want to come back and dip my toes in the water once again. Yeah. So, you know, I haven't played a tournament in six years, almost to the date. I mean, it was... Uh, it was June of 2018 that I played my very last tournament, uh, the Missoula tournament up in, in, uh, Montana, me and me and double G went into a nice battle. Double G got me there at the end, but, uh, you know, that was, that was, uh, the end of my road. And, uh, I wanted to start a new journey, which was opening my own business, becoming a professional brewer. And, and honestly, when I did it, when, when that happened, I kind of thought I'll probably never be back. It's just my personality. I kind of like being all in on things. And I just, I know what it takes to become the best. And I know what it takes to, you know, cash in a tournament and, and kind of even make it, make, make it worth it. But, 
You know, last year I was watching the USDGC at home with my kid, uh, my at the time my three month old baby uh, son Luca, and I saw my friends playing. Some of the guys that you know, like Steve Brinster, Will Schusterick, some of these previous champions, and I was like, man, I'm I'm kind of like the only previous champion not at this tournament. So I texted Jonathan. I said, hey, you know. I know previous champs get in. He's like, yeah, yeah. If you want to play, you know, register next year and let's, let's do it. So that was kind of what prompted it all. And then I thought to my head, man, I cannot just go out to Rock Hill <laughs> cold, like, not even knowing if I can do this anymore. And uh, so I was talking to Jeff and we were talking about the Portland Open. He wanted me to play. He's like, dude, you should play the Portland Open. I thought, Dude, no way. Two courses, they're super long, like all that practice. I said, what about the Beaver State? He said, yeah, you know, that that could work. So I hit up the tournament director, Jesse, and uh, full disclosure, man, I am so thankful and lucky that I even have the opportunity to play still. You know, there's so many great players, and, you know, just because of my past – it allows me to get in, um, you know, by, by basically just asking a question and getting that opportunity. So I'm super thankful. I talked to Jesse, the TD. He said, let's do it, man. I got a spot and I'll put you in. So I'm, I'm in. I have been practicing lately and, uh, you know, ho hopefully uh, it goes well. That's awesome. And I think, I think the pro tour would be very dumb not to allow you to play an event. Um, I think there's reasons why they have like sponsored exemptions and other things and other tournaments as well. I thought it was crazy that Avery Jenkins was on the grounds at worlds last year and could not play like that to me, just like blows. two years ago, maybe it was whatever his no, streak. It was last, no, it, no, it was last it year. Was last GMC. Year. It was last year. Yeah. What, which one broke his streak? Was that GMC? Uh, yeah. It was I, the I one think... that was in Vermont. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like that, the idea of like having greats from the past come back and wanting to play like that is really where these spots that are reserved for, you know, whoever they want. Like, I think you're going to bring a lot more attention to the tournament, whether you want to or not, you're going to, there's going to be tons of eyeballs and you would probably be one of the most favorite, you know, back in the day on UDIS where you could like uh, favorite players to see, um, if you could still do that, the technology hasn't somehow crossed over to the PGA live yet. Not sure when we'll get that maybe in 2025, but, uh, you would probably be one of the most liked, uh, players. I'm sure people are going to be definitely checking to see, uh, how you finish up and how that, um, okay. Before we go and talk is obviously I have so many questions on like modern disc golf. How, like what, what got you into disc golf? Cause I don't really know. And this is what I was telling with Yuli. There's like not that much like history for us that, you know, I got into disc golf right around 2020. So other than like hearing stories from people, there's not really that much history podcasts, articles of where I can go and learn a lot about players that played 10, 15, 20 years ago. So where, like, where was your upbringings? What got you into disc golf and what made you uh, want to become and become one of the best players to ever do it? Well, it, 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 it's a long story and, uh, you know, we need like 20 podcasts, but the reality is, is I was very lucky where I started playing disc golf and where I grew up. So I, I started in Santa Cruz, California, at De La Viega disc golf course. Um, the Masters Cup it has been a tournament since the, the since the mid '80s, and some of the best players in the world had always come to, to California. So, we, my dad, actually found the sport in 1991. Uh, was the fall of '91. He had gone a couple of times. Finally, my mom said, "Hey, like you better take Nathan up there with you. You need to tire him out. I'm a little six year old kid." run around acting all crazy. She said, take Nathan with you. You got to go up there. And so that's, that's kind of how it started. And, and immediately I met Marty Hapner, Tom shot, um, a few others, Dave LeVan guys that are part of the, the actual hall of fame now. Um, and those were the first, first people that I was introduced to the spring of 92 was the very first master's cup that I ever saw. Ken Climo, Scott Stokely, several other great players, Jeff Lisman. 
And from right there, I just, I saw what the best players in the world could do. And that's basically all I wanted to do from like seven years old until now, still to this day. And, you know, for me, disc golf is not just something that I got into. It's, it's my life. It is my heart, soul, blood. It runs through my veins every single day. And it's because of that opportunity to be a part of a community in Santa Cruz with De La Viego, just a lot of great people. We're all, there's, it's a subculture there. And, um, and then of course, like I said, the master's cup every single year. Um, I first got to meet Kenny in person and in 1995, I think it was, you know, Barry started coming into town in like 97 and every year it was just the best players, you know, coming into town, getting to spectate them. And, and that's how I was able to, you know, I think get better so quickly. Cause back in those days, there was no YouTube. And there was no watching disc golf. You had to watch it with your own two eyes. And unless those guys came to your town, you weren't going to see it. And so I got to see it. I got to learn from the best. And in 1999, I, uh, at 14 years old, I won the junior world championship out in Kansas city. I turned pro the very next week, played a tournament in Auburn, California. And, uh, and then in at the master's cup of 2000, this is 24 years ago. I cashed for my very first time. I was 15 years old. So I was officially a pro. And from there, I never looked back. Dang. So was it um, back in those like pre YouTube days? Because I saw this a lot with Ultimate Frisbee, which I think you didn't actually have cassette tapes. <laughs> oh, dude, dude, I wore <laughs> out the cassette tapes, dude. Yeah, my dad, I knew it. I my knew dad, it. dude, my dad had to buy extra tapes of all the tournaments that would come out on tape because I would watch them over and over and over, and there was only a handful. I mean, it was a couple of world championships, like, like, and that wasn't even until like 95. So hell yeah, I watched VHS. You know what? (laughs) Could you, like, did people in that pre YouTube zone, did they know who, like what actually was good at like what, who was good at disc golf? Because something that I saw a lot in ultimate Frisbee is when I would go and do a clinic or, um, uh, go and do the, the you know this tour of where I'm helping schools and stuff. A lot of times it's just like, yeah, this is the best player in our city. So we all just listen to what he has to say. And we all think that's the best thing to do. When in fact, you're like, no, no, no. He's teaching you guys all the wrong stuff. Do not listen to Is that <laughs> kind of, was it like the wild, wild West back then too, of where someone's like, oh, this is how you should throw a backhand. And you're just like, looking back at it now, you're like, holy smokes. We had no idea what we were doing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, really, when you start to think about the generation that was just ahead of Ken Climo, which, you know, he was about 89, 90 when he, you know, was starting to win big time. The, th- this is the infancy of even disc golf. I mean, the beveled edge di- disc was barely invented. So I think it took about fif- 10 to 15 years for like, hundreds of different styles of throwing to be, to be even become popular. You know, you had a guy like Scott Stokely, Scott, even in the early days would travel around doing clinics, teaching people how to throw sidearms. Um, so there was a little bit of that going on, but I think it was kind of like regionally, right? Were you playing in Arizona where the courses were all kind of Mm. big and wide open? Were you playing in the Northeast where everything was wooded and you had all these specialists and Climo was basically the first person with any success anyways, to really be able to do anything anywhere very consistently. I think a lot of people tried to, to follow what he did. Um, and then the other thing is putting back in those days, the baskets, you know, they did not catch as good and everybody had to push putt. Once the basket started getting more chain, a bigger sweet spot, that's when, spin putting became very, very popular. So yeah, man, it, it, I wouldn't call it the wild west. I just feel like it was kind of the collective disc golf world, figuring it out on their own. And nowadays, you know, you got millions of hours of footage to watch. So 
you can kind of learn from the best already from anywhere. I feel like it kind of was a wild, wild west because when I first came up, Dan Ginley was the best in Arizona and he did that little hop. So I, I remember being yep. like, Oh, this, so this yeah, is the way that you the throw hop. it. <laughs> and so I hopped, that's exactly what I did. And then where I grew up playing, there was this guy named Kim and he could throw this little sidearm really accurate through the woods. And that's how I developed my sidearm. It looks exactly like that guy. And I've ho- held on to the sidearm. I ditched the, the backhand, no offense, Danny, but, uh, <laughs> But I, I feel like it was a little bit, you know, like you said, regionally, like he was the best. So that's the way that I, I didn't know that there was other ways to throw. I just thought, okay, you guys are doing it this way. This guy's winning. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Yeah. And it's one of those things, dude. And I, and I do agree with that. It, I always say you can, you can literally do anything if you just practice it enough. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can, yeah. it, there's no such thing as the perfect throw. If you practice the ugliest tee shot ever, but you make it work, it works. I mean, imagine those guys that just throw overhands, you know, like permanently, that's all they do. And somehow they can <laughs> yeah. still shoot a 10 down on their local course. You know, it does happen, but there's also yeah. now things that are tried and true proven yep, yep. that work. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, I love the variation. I, you know, when you watch Eagle McMahon throw versus Calvin Heimberg, you know, there's nothing similar, but Wildly they both get the job yeah. done. You know, his name is escaping me. Was it Ron something? Who was Russell. the guy? Ron Russell. He, he, he like tried to sneak up on the basket when he putted. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, like yep. his his back was towards the basket or something when he put. Yes. Oh yeah. And he'd yep. like look over his shoulder and then, like, you can't tell me that people were looking at that being like, that's. I mean, you see it with Paige Pierce. Like there was girls doing the little head thing, right? Like before oh, yeah. you put, which is like, there's no way that is the most efficient way to put, right? But well, they. The funniest one was Macbeth's little leg thing that he did. And then I went over to Europe like four <laughs> years later and every little kid before their oh, father, they like, did like, like, shit dirt. Dirt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I have oh, yeah. to do this or I'm not going to make this putt. <laughs> oh, Dude, you know, it's funny yeah. about, it's funny about Ron Russell. Cause you know, Ron had, Ron had the strangest putting form ever. But when that dude was hot, it was 80 and in every time. And I'm not, I'm not even kidding. It was 80. He was dead from 80. And, you know, you got to give respect to the guy. He broke Climo's streak in a time when yeah. nobody thought that was possible. And I first met Ron after he won that world in 99. He actually came out to California for one of the first trips, came to the master Cup. I got to meet him. And, uh, I started, I wasn't sneaking up on the basket with my shoulder, (laughs) but I started putting Anheuser. And Mm. what I noticed was with Ron, because it was, it was a shoulder turn and an Anheuser putt. The Anheuser from distance kind of had two chances to go in. If you popped it with enough turnover, you could nail it that way. But if you got it long enough, it could twist back and go in. And so I started putting Anheuser and that was in 2000 and Five years later, I won the world championship with an Anheuser putt. I know Yuli can attest to that. He's seen that putt. But, you know, that's what I'm saying, man. You can make anything work. And, uh, you know, I learned that from Ron, actually. So much respect. Hey, and I hurt my wrist in like 2012 or something. And I started putting the Anheuser. And I copied it from from your stroke. So Right. There you go. There yeah, some of that putts similar to that right now that's very, very uh, effective on tours, uh, Matt Oram. He's exactly. kind of got he's kind of got that little Anheuser snap putt. Um, he's one of the only ones that has just held on to the same everything <laughs> for however long it's been, like 20 years. Like the glasses, even the glasses guy. falling off his head. Like he will never <laughs> get glasses that don't fall off. He has to have glasses he's, that fall off. He's been pretty wild his whole career. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, crazy to see. All right, let's let's fast forward a little bit here, and then we're gonna go backwards as well in time. But let's fast forward a little bit to the moment that you decided, like, hey, I'm done. 
was you kind of mentioned it a little bit w did you know this is like hey this is going to be my last tournament or like how how did that all transpire you know <sighs> It's one of those things. I didn't know that it was going to be my last tournament forever. And clearly now it's not because I am going to come back and play at the very least in a few weeks out in at the Beaver state. But I, I actually, you kind of got to, it, to me, it, it kind of goes back to about when I was 30 ish, 29 ish. I started thinking in my head, I'm not going to be able to play disc golf forever. And the, the, like, kind of that money that you need to survive once your game goes down was not really available. Right. Mm. I mean, I spent my, from 2005 <clears throat> till the day I kind of retired was near the top of the leaderboard and that, and I was able to make some good money, but it wasn't the kind of money we see today. So I was starting to plan it out. I'm thinking, man, I got to do something, start my own business whatever, maybe I could do clinics, but that, I don't know. I'm, I'm not that good at clinics. So <clears throat> I was starting to get into craft beer. My father-in-law, which is Avery and Val's dad, Leroy Jenkins, he was also into it. They wanted to start a, a, a brewery slash bar. I thought, man, that would be pretty cool. So we just started planning, started planning. And then um, it kind of all came together. So actually like the off season of 20. 17 into 2018 we got like a, we got all of our money together we actually signed a lease on a building but i couldn't break ground until middle of june so i was good i had to play right up until that time and uh it just happened to be missoula and you know we got our uh we got the go ahead and start working on things that weekend and we headed home and and that was it and you know it it's just I know people can kind of sit here now and say, dude, why, why did you, why? It's not like I woke up that day after Missoula and said, you know, man, I just don't want to play anymore. This was five years of planning while I was still competing, while I was still traveling. I mean, Valerie won in 2014, the worlds, you know, we, we were still at that level. I mean, Dude, I mean, in 2017, I won the GMC. Yeah. And it just, I had to figure out something. And timing might have been a little off if I waited, call it two, three more years. Things might have been a little different. But at the end of the day, I am so thankful for the way it went down. And, uh, you know, I still love watching disc golf and commentating it and being a part of the sport in that way, too. <laughs>